Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining me on the podcast number five, segment 23, R. Kelly Appeal TV. And we're going to be reading the fifth video for the podcast um, from Solar Coaster, A Diary of Me by R. Kelly. I thank all those who are consistently coming to the live at 6 p.m. every day. I'm doing this every day now, not just Sunday, to get through the book. So we'll have a lot to discuss um, while we're waiting on the appeal um, for May the 4th. So let's jump right into it. One day I'm going to be a symbol. I'm going to stand for Chicago. Jump shot. There were times when I had to get out of my house. There was too much noise, screaming, arguing. There were too many people having sex. A bike ride was a great escape. By the time I was 11 or 12 years old, I rode my Huffy bike all the way from 34th Street to the Sears Tower. At the time, the tallest building in the world on South Walker Drive. When I got near, I look up at that awesome skyscraper and think, it's going to fall on me. Crazy as it sounds, I'd get scared, but I wouldn't run. Rather than back away from the tower, I get closer. I get right underneath it. I challenge it and say, Sears Tower, I dare you to fall on me. I dare you to scare me anymore. You ain't nothing but steel and concrete. You might be some kind of symbol of this city, but I'm going to be a symbol. I'm going to stand for Chicago. One day, I'm going to stand as tall as you. I remember that day like it just happened. It, it had rained the night before and riding my bike down Martin Luther King Boulevard, the morning mist felt fresh on my face. Inside my head, I was hearing music. Music was drowning out the rest of the world. Music was my shield and protector. It was a blessing and a burden. It was heavy on my head when I was pedaling down to the playground to hoop with my pals. Like a lot of kids, I was dreaming of playing in the NBA like Dr. J. Folks said that the south side of Chicago was rough, but I never fooled with the rough guys. They didn't bother me. Their business didn't interest me. I wasn't afraid of the streets. Hearing gunshots, for example, was no big thing. Been hearing them my whole life. But this gunshot was different. This pow rang in my ear and suddenly I felt something hit me in the chest. My head went woozy and I couldn't control the bike. Then everything got crazy and strange. It was like I was leaving my body. In slow motion, I saw myself falling off the bike. My vision went blurry and I saw people running towards me. Before long, my mother was running up to me along with my sister and brothers. I heard them in an echo, saw them in a fog. Robert's been shot, my mother shouted. My baby's been shot. I closed my eyes and lost consciousness. When I woke up, I was in the hospital. My shoulder was hurting something fierce. Mom was sitting next to me, holding my hand. Rob, God is good. God spared your life, baby, she moaned. What happened? You got shot, son. Who shot me? We don't know. Years later, after I had some success, BET was doing a show about where I grew up. As I was showing the director and the film crew around the hood, we ran into... The guy who shot me, he'd gone to jail for what he had done, and he talked about it on camera. It was all good. Then he handed me a demo tape to check out to see if I could do anything for him. But back then, I was only worried about one thing. Will I be able to shoot the ball? Doctor said you'll be fine. They can't take out the bullet because it's too close to a nerve. If they take that nerve, it could paralyze the whole half of your body. So they're going to leave it in there. They say the tissue will grow up around the bullet. The blessing is that the bullet didn't hit your head or your heart. The blessing is that God has plans, beautiful plans for you. But will I still be able to make my jump shot? I had to know. Three weeks later, I was back on my bike pedaling over to the playground to work on my jump shot. Because of the bullet in my shoulder, my shot was off and I wasn't happy. I was frustrated and I cried about it because it hurt like hell when I tried to lift my arm. But I really got scared when I started shooting funny. I wanted my jumper back. More than anything in the world, I wanted to feel that sweet power of the ball going in the hoop. The pain didn't matter. 
How could I go through life without a killer jump shot? There are more important things in this world than a good jump shot, my mother told me when I got home. Like what? Like music? You were born to sing songs, not shoot basketball. I didn't dare talk back to her, but in my mind, I was thinking, I got to get my jump shot back. My jump shot was all I had. How else could I get out of the hood and take care of my mother? <clears throat> I grew up in Madden Park. That's where the big boys hooped. We called it the uncle's tournament. Hope. Some kids were scared of the streets and with good reason. Some kids were scared of the playgrounds where the bullies and game bangers acted like they ruled the world. But none of that scared me, not even after I was shot. Instead, I was scared of the classroom, scared of being called on, scared of everyone learning that I couldn't do what they could do, read and write. No one wanted to learn more than me and no one seemed more troubled. The minute the bell rang, I ran out of school like a bat out of hell. I couldn't wait to get to the playground and find me a game of basketball. One day when I was 11, on my way to hoop, me and some of my homies got cornered by thugs looking to steal our lunch money. I wasn't about to get messed up over lunch money, so I gave him my change. One homie, though, refused. It's my goddamn money, he said. Without even hesitating, two of the gangbangers slashed his face with a broken whiskey bottle. That's when I knew that I had made the right decision. I spent the rest of the afternoon at the playground working on that jump shot. Still, um, wasn't right. Every year when we were growing up, there was an amazing event called the Bud Billiken Parade and Picnic. Coca-Cola had a float. McDonald's had a float. Jesse Jackson had a float. Entertainers waved at people. Singers sang. Musicians played. And there was funky music, good food, and good times. We looked forward to the parade every year. It was our Disneyland, like Walt Disney was coming to us. You got to see all kinds of celebrities if you were lucky. Everyone, mom, grandma, all the aunties, uncles, and cousins would start out early setting up their little chairs and crates with their cards and beer and wait for the parade to come by. It was an all-day free party right on our street. The parade started at 35th and King, and when we lived on 40th and King, me and my brothers would follow the parade all the way to the end. I went to all the barbecues and picnics and looked at all the floats. I saw all the performances. I was inspired by the parade. I got to see a lot of artists who performed on floats. New Edition, Belle Biv DeVoe, everybody wanted to be in the Bud Billiken Parade. Years later, when I was about 15 or 16, I sang for Lionel Richie. He was performing at the parade that year and somebody had told him that I could sing and write songs. He asked them to bring me over to him and he asked me to sing him something I wrote. I couldn't remember what the name of the song was, but Lionel Richie offered me $500 on the spot to give him the song. Um, now, at that time I was broke. I couldn't even pay attention and $500 was a lot of money. But even back then I knew that my work was worth more than that. So I turned them down. I always wanted to be on a floating performing like the groups that were famous back then. I would be on I would be in the crowd following the floats and waving. In 2011, I felt truly blessed to be the honorable grand marshal of the oldest and largest African American parade in the country. As my float rolled down King Drive, I pictured my mother sitting in her chair with the rest of the family and her friends watching the parade go by as she had for so many years. I wish she could have been there to see her son wave to her. I always loved music and I always loved basketball. In those days when I was hooping, you could always find me at Washington Park, Madden Park at 33rd or King Drive. Madden Park was where the big boys hooped. The older guys were much stronger than us kids and they played harder. They banged. I always wanted to play with them. I never wanted to play with the guys my age. I knew if I played with the older guys, my game would get tighter. So I called next meaning the, well, we got the next game. But once we got on the court, we regretted it because the older dudes didn't play. They were rough. They didn't care nothing about your age. They were out to win at any cost. They hit hard. I saw many shoulders dislocated, knees shattered, heads smashed on concrete. 
I got banged up so hard I couldn't help but be nervous, but I knew the only way to get over it was to keep on playing. I missed a lot of shots. I threw the ball away more times than I could count. Sometimes the bigger guys literally took the ball out of my hands. They frustrated me until I was ready to quit, but I never did. One day after a rough game, this older guy came up to me and said, you know what you're doing wrong, young fella? Yeah, I'm missing a lot of shots. I'm throwing the ball away and they're taking it from me. It's more than that, he said. You're chasing the game. You're not letting the game come to you. Don't know what you mean. Well, you need to know, bro. You need to stop forcing your shots. You got to find your groove. Will that give me points? It's not about shooting the ball in a basket, he said. It's about being positive. Dew had an interesting way of talking, so I kept listening. Plus, he saw I had something. He believed in me. His name was Robert Reed. The other guys called him Hope. At that time, Hope was on his way to becoming a neighborhood legend because of his street ball skills. His mother and, and my mom were very close. She lived right across the street from us. Hope was slim and smooth talking. He was about 14 years old, older than me, about five foot eight with a face like Dr. J later. Um, when I watched him on his Robert Reed all-star team, I saw he had Dr. J's moves. Hope was a great point guard. He invited me and Bruce, whose hoop skills were sharper than mine, to his place. Hoop schooled us. He had reels of MP NBA films. As we watched the movies, he pointed out subtle moves we had been missing. He talked about going with the flow, finding the flow. Hope said, it's everything. The game's got a flow and you got a flow. The art is to let those two flows flow together. Hope knew I was into music, so he kept making musical comparisons. There's a righteous rhythm to every movement, he explained. It isn't something you create. The rhythms already there. You tap into it. You ride it. You let it take you where it wants to go. Hope was a beautiful guy. I could feel that his mind was elevated, even though I couldn't do everything he suggested. For example, he said that rage always hurts. Well, if I was in a close game and someone tripped me on purpose, I went to rage. Didn't know any other way. Control that rage, advised Hope. If you don't, rage will control you. When rage is in charge, your game falls apart. I knew that was right. I had seen it happen, but I was still in no control of my fits of rage. I got less angry, though, when Hope showed me how to finesse my jump shot. After I got shot, Hope helped me work on getting my jump shot back. You fighting that shoulder injury, he said, talking about that bullet lodged in my body. Don't fight it. Work with it. Hope is one of my best friends to this very day. I still respect his wisdom when it comes to basketball. It was because of Hope that I started developing and strengthening my shoulder. Hope helped me rediscover my game. Bruce and I used a practice move that ta um, Hope taught us in the backyard. First, we met, nailed a bottomless crate to a pole. Then we moved on up to a bike wheel that we took all the spokes out of and then moved up to a rim. We called it Planet Dunk a Lot. After playing for hours, we went over to 42nd and state for the best foot longs on the planet. Polish sausages smothered with onions, flaming hot barbecue sauce, and a mountain of french fries. It was all good. <laughs> Until you just can't boogie no more. In Chicago, you love the sweetness of summer because you've made it through the meanness of winter. One summer Saturday, the streets were bouncing and the whole neighborhood was dancing to the sound of my brother Bruce's band. Me and my mother were singing Taste of Honey's Boogie Oogie Oogie. She looked over at me, um, me looking over at her, smiling all the while, a singing team that had everyone up and happy. Wasn't always that way, though. There's a story behind how I got to sing that day. My brother Bruce's band was pretty cool. Bruce played bass. A guy named Pookie was on lead guitar. Pookie's brother, brothers were also in the band. Al on drums and Terry on synths. They did all instrumental versions of popular songs. 
I watched them rehearse on the porch and I knew the songs that they would rehearse and I sang along with them in my head. Naturally, I wanted to sing with them, but Bruce would always tell me they didn't want a lead singer. I really wanted to be in that band, but the more I wanted it, the more Bruce seemed to be against it. When it came to anything to do with music, I knew my stuff for example, Bruce and his band would all tune up this at the same time. I told them, if y'all tune up at the same time, by the end of the tuning session, everybody will be pretty much off key. Better to tune up one at a time. Get out of here, Bruce said. What do you know about this stuff, little bro? I said, bro said, I can sing. We good, Robbie said. We don't need no singer. I may have been younger, but I knew he was wrong. They played songs like Cool in the Gang, Ladies Night, that needed a singer. It was just a situation, though, where Big Bro didn't want to mess with Little Bro. But Little Bro wasn't going away. <laughs> I kept bugging Bruce to give me a chance. Let me rehearse. Let me sing. He kept saying they wanted to do only instrumentals. Finally, I went to the boss, mom. When I told her the story, she was really feeling me. After all, she was a singer too. She told Bruce, if you don't let Rob sing in your band, there ain't going to be no band. Bruce had no choice. He told me what songs he wanted to sing and I was ready, except for one thing. I didn't know all the lyrics. I'll have Lizette write the words out for me, said Bruce. Um, oh, I'll, okay, start here. I'll have Lizette write the words out for you, said Bruce. Lizette had good handwriting and she printed the lyrics to the OJs. Used to be my girl in Earth, Wind and Fire, Serpentine Fire. The words were written on yellow pad. The letters were big. The words couldn't be plainer, but I had a hard time reading them. I had a hard time reading anything. As I stumbled over the lyrics, Bruce and the other guys saw that I couldn't even make out simple words. At first, I tried to play it off like I couldn't really see them, but they figured it out. I think Bruce saw this as a way to keep me out of the group. I got embarrassed because I thought he might be right. If I can't read, how am I going to be able to do this? So I stopped singing and left. That night, my mother saw how upset I was. What's wrong, baby? I told her about how I had made a fool of myself. No child of mine is a fool, she said. It's just that music comes easy to you and reading doesn't. What you need to do, son, is listen to the records and get the words directly from the singers. Memorize the lyrics from the record. Then you don't have to read. All you got to do is sing. And your singing is something no one can make fun of. I did what my mother said. I learned the words from the records. And to make me feel even more secure, she came out there so we could sing side by side. We sounded good as taste, good as taste of honey, maybe better. Once I learned all the songs, it got to the point where we would plug in, in and sit on the porch and play the whole block. Would, would turn out with people coming everywhere just to listen to us. Growing up, Bruce and I were close. We get into all kinds of trouble together in spite of the fact that in the beginning he didn't want me in the band. We'd act up with all sorts of pranks. Sometimes we play with our food. Our mother hated that, but you know how boys are. One night, mom fixed us a traditional soul food dinner, ham hocks, pinto beans, cornbread, and greens. I liked it all, except the greens. Couldn't stand greens. When my mother went back into the kitchen, Bruce and I started messing with our food. I stabbed the greens with my fork flicked them up, and just like that, they flew across the room and stuck against the wall. Mom didn't notice them that night, but the next night with Grandma at the table, she did. Who the hell threw those greens against the wall, she asked. Bruce, I said, pointing at my brother. Rob, said Bruce, pointing it back at me. One of y'all is lying, she said. I want to know which one. Bruce is lying, I said. I'm telling the truth. Bruce shot back. Rob's lying. Robert would never lie, said Grandma, my staunchest defender. If she hadn't said that, maybe I would have confessed, but I don't want to look like a liar in front of grandma. She had me up on a pedestal. Okay, said mom. If that's how y'all want to play it, fine. I'll get right back. I'll be right back. She went out in the yard in the back and got a switch. Don't whip Rob, said. Don't whip Rob, said grandma. He'd never do nothing like that. And if he did, he'd never lie about it. Stay out of this, mom told her mother. There, this here is between me and my sons. Mom next turned to us and said, pull your pants down right here. I asked right in front of grandma. <laughs> you heard me, boy, right here. 
It was embarrassing, but we did it. We stuck out our booties and mom started whipping us. First Bruce, then me, then back to Bruce, then back to me. It got to hurting so bad, I finally blurted out the truth. Okay, I confessed. I was the one. I threw the greens. Go to your room, Bruce. She said, Rob, you stay here. Before she started whipping me again, I looked over at grandma and saw the sad look on her face. I had let her down. Meanwhile, mom was more furious than disappointed. She took that switch and let me have it twice as hard. When she was through, I could barely walk. Now get out of here, she said, and get in your room. Think about what you did. Think about what lying got you. And Rob, if I ever catch you lying like that again, I'm going to, I'm giving you an even worse whooping. You hear me, son? Yes, ma'am, I said. So right there, we're going to stop. Um, and uh, tomorrow we're going to go into Willie Pearl. So we're going to find out who Willie Pearl was in his life. But right now I want to talk about how the stage is being set. Joanne Kelly was trying to be as strong as she could as a mother, a single parent woman at that with boys. Um, she had a sense of what was really happening in her life um, when, with her boys. She knew when Rob was lying and when he wasn't. And she was on point with it. I mean, I, I get that. So what do you think in this segment was the turning point of honesty within Robert. I mean, do you feel that Robert had a way of manipulating the, the situation to the point where he did it without even knowing he was doing it, becoming a, a manipulator through the games that he played with his brothers, through the way that people were really around him, so many people. So he was building a celebrity status right there. What about meeting his ego when he was standing uh, uh, near the Sears Tower? Was that something that kind of provoked possible an introduction of ego? Because around the time of 10 or, you know, so, you know, between um, toddler age and adolescence, we are talking to our ego and we don't know that we're doing it. We're building up that that protection when we can't help ourselves and we don't even know we're doing it. By the time we hit 10, 11 or 12 adolescents, then that is more like I'm talking to my ego and, and my ego is my best friend because it listens to everything I say. So when he was talking to the Sears Tower, could that have been a moment of egoic connection? And in that, was it a lie for him? Was it okay to lie about his fears and then getting shot? I mean, this young man went through so, so much and he did it like a champion. So, so let's, let's put some comments in the comment box and share what your feelings are about this segment and we'll see you tomorrow.